Hi, my name is Nicole Michelle Weimer, and I'm originally from Hawaii, United States of America, from a small town called Mililani, and I currently live in Dorito, Estonia. I'm a master's student in a program called Folkloristics and Applied Heritage Studies with a specialization in food culture. So today's theme that I'll be discussing with you folks today is rural cultural food tourism. And within that theoretical framework, I'll be contextualizing Avatu Talute Payev, which is Open Farm Day in Estonian. And it's an event held over the course of two days. So within that, I'll be using a case study I conducted through those two days on a small goat farm located in central Estonia. Avatu Talute Payev is an event that is organized by the Estonian government as an opportunity for the local farmers to welcome the public and demonstrate what it is that they do on their farms. The life and work of the farmer, the animals, machinery, and for many it's an occasion to present and sell the products that they've grown and created. The event itself is organized and conducted by the Ministry of Rural Affairs, the Rural Networking Department of Agriculture Research Center, Central Union of Estonian Farmers, and the Estonian Chamber of Agriculture and Commerce. In conjunction, the local leader action groups within Estonia are also organizers, as well as the Estonian village movement group called Kurukant. Avatu Talu De Payev is funded by the Estonian Rural Development Plan 2014 to 2020, as well as the European Agriculture Fund for Rural Development. To connect the significance of these organizations, I will be explaining some of the general backgrounds and aims of LEADER and Kodukant. So LEADER is a European-based program that consists of 26 different countries. The name is a French acronym that I am unfit to pronounce, but it translates in English as links between rural economy and development actions. You're welcome to refer to the article I have written jointly with this video for the actual acronym in its original language. Leaders' program intentions are to incorporate rural community members to be active participants in the development of their rural spaces and communities. This is sought through the formulation of LAG, Local Action Groups, which focuses on the formulation and implementation of locally designed policies and solutions. Estonia is one of the 26 different countries involved, but also has its own program called Kodukont, which is the Estonian Village Movement. It is a non-governmental organization that came to be shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union, which Estonia was a part of, and therefore following the collapse of society as a whole, particularly in the rural areas of Estonia. This initiative operates on three different levels, starting from the local villages to the county, and finally nationally. The aims of Kodukant reflect very similarly to that of LEADER, to highlight and exemplify the importance of re-establishing and maintaining connections to the rural communities as a way of preservation of rural heritage, traditions and culture, the local economy, networking and communications, as well as the growth and development of rural areas. The 2019 Avatu Talude Payev event was held over the course of two days, Saturday and Sunday, July 20th and 21st. In total, over 300 different types of farms participated all over Estonia, including the islands Sodomal and Hiomal. Some types of farms that partook in the Open Farm Day event are dairy farms such as goats, cows, and even sheep. These farms make a variety of dairy goods ranging from simply the milk to fresh and aged cheeses, yogurt, ice cream, and even sweet goods such as caramel creme. Other farms producing consumable goods also offer things such as heirloom vegetables, honey, meats from pork, bovines, lambs, and fish, to beverages such as apple juice and apple cider. However, while a good portion of farms do produce consumable food products, there also were farms that specialized in non-consumable products, such as farms that offered rural retreat spaces, meditation sessions in the countryside, retreats that focus on disconnecting from our mobile phones, medicinal herb gardens, riding horses, flower gardens, and so forth. Within the event itself, there are many thematic points which could be discussed, such as the global impact and trends of the rural, the politics of rural and globalization, local heritage, the meaningful relationship of rural inhabitants with their work, products, animals, and the landscape, to even the revitalization of rural lifestyle and the recognition and protection of rural heritage and practices in post-modernity. 
While all of these themes are pertinent, I will be discussing another theme, the movement of rural cultural food tourism and its significance as well as impact for the rural inhabitants as well as urban participators. So what is rural cultural food tourism? To simplify the concept, it could be understood as a means to build and sustain local foods and products that are both situated and imported from rural landscapes. This trend has been seeing traction with urbanites choosing to head into the countryside to experience more nature, farm-produced products, and connecting with those that sustain local food heritage. In the article, Food Tourism, Niche Markets, and Products in Rural Tourism, Katia Sidali, Elizabeth Kastenholz, and Rosella Bianchi state that rural tourists show a higher willingness to pay for such embedded food specialties and associated experiences and sometimes drive many kilometers to participate in food-related activities. Thus, it is evident that rural tourists can play an important role in acting as a cultural broker or gatekeeper between different actors' arenas, farmers, consumers, institutions, thus contributing to rural development and cultural sustainability. There are a few keynotes that have critical roles to play in regards to rural food tourism. The first of that being political statements being made by consumers and rural producers against the monopoly of giant food industries. Uh, there is also the pursuit of healthy, clean, and good food, food that has not been tainted by these big corporations, such as meats that have been given antibiotics, steroids, and feed that is unsuitable for the animal's consumption in hopes of producing a larger output of goods. Studies have shown that consuming high amounts of preservatives on natural foods have proven to wreak havoc on the human's biological system, as well as the psychological and emotional state of being. Another keynote within the theme of rural cultural food tourism is reestablishing of relationships. As industrialization grew to be what it is today, the distance of people interacting with their food has become a very large gap. Human history starts where food was hunted and gathered for hundreds of years. Then agriculture took root in civilization. What has happened since is that humans no longer cultivate a majority of their diets as it has been done in the past, for they occupy spaces within urban centers for economic prosperity and luxury. These small spaces dissuade and prevent vegetables from being grown, as well as meats and dairy products from being cultivated on a larger scale. What has been a small bridge between this has been farmer's markets, a place where farmers gathered collectively to sell their products and consumers being granted the opportunities to locally source their food. However, even this space has seen shifts and changes as well. The rise of rural cultural food tourism has been an initiative to carve a niche in the globalized world and market. And this has been relatively successful as people are starved for the relationship between the grower and themselves. Sandra Renko, Natasha Renko, and Thea Polonio in their article, Understanding the Role of Food in Rural Tourism Development in a Recovering Economy, claim that through the utilization of food within the rural tourist industry, the food products act as consumable symbols of intangible cultural heritage in which both locals and visitors can interact and interpret. In such a way, tourists are also able to experience a more genuine connection with that of the local culture through the cuisine, thereby adding value to an image of a destination. Avatu Talu de Bayev thus acts as a facilitator for urban Estonians to re-engage with the rural Estonians who carry on their traditions and practices. To contextualize these theories introduced, I will be utilizing a case study conducted at Seitsukitsitale, a small goat farm in central Estonia. Estonia is one of the three Baltic countries of northern Europe, the other two being Latvia and Lithuania. Estonia is the northernmost of the three countries and is situated below Finland, divided by the Gulf of Finland. In central Estonia, Seitsukitsitale began as a goat farm about four years ago. Anne, whose name has been changed, is a farmer and producer of goat milk products. She lives in the countryside with her husband and young child, farming goats, chickens, and turkeys, along with their two large herding dogs, two cats, and 14 rabbits. Their home is located on the outskirts of the local town, where fields of pasture and wheat border them and the main road, and where nature's symphony is conducted daily, the wind rustling through the birch leaves, crickets chirping at dusk, and the goats calling to be milked or playing on their wood and climbing structures. Anne loves animals, 
in fact, maybe more than people, and feels an intense and profound connection with them, one that comes naturally to her. She decided to work with goats because it would offer some form of economic income for her and her family while meeting two of her most important values, the relationship shared between her and the animals, and the production and consumption of food that is clean and natural. Her milk herd stands at a humble yet large number of 23 goats, small enough to know each and every goat and their unique personalities, but large enough to produce enough dairy products to continuously stock her small store. Each morning and evening she milks her goats, reaching upwards to about 30 liters per month. From there, she makes a small selection of delicious fresh cheese, natural flavor, chili, rosemary, thyme, and fennel seed. Each flavor is delicious in its own right, and the cheese maintains a sweet and subtle flavor of good grass, tender flowers, sunshine, and goats that are genuinely happy. Anne stated that she wants to step away from making goat cheese to sell, as anybody can make goat cheese, and would like to focus and specialize on making goat butter, which is more niche than goat cheese. Silky gold in color with a slight transparency, the butter tastes different than those made commercially and even from cow's milk. It holds earthy flavors, but not so much to be off-putting, but rather to complexify and capture the nuances of rural flavors. Two days a week, Anne focuses on making her cheese, flavoring it, molding it, and packaging it. She has spent the last few weeks in preparation for her first time participating in the Avatu Talude Bayev event. On Saturday, the day before Anne's farm would be open to the public, a lot of time was spent finalizing the products that she had planned to sell, as well as cleaning and reorganizing the farm to accommodate the anticipated influx of crowds. She moves swiftly, jumping from one task to another, from proofing the white and black bread doughs that she made from scratch, chopping cucumbers, potatoes, dill and onions, pitting cherries from a nearby orchard, whisking dozens of golden egg yolks sourced directly from her chickens, combining dry ingredients for the flaky pastry dough, moving furniture and tables out to the yard, cleaning and reorganizing, as well as bottling and labeling the different types of cheese. It's a day that is spent in frenzy, but luckily Anne has conscripted her sister, two neighbors, two friends and their children, as well as myself, to divide and conquer the long list of to-dos. It was not until sunset, when the sky became a dusky rose, soft blue, and deep purple hue, that we finally finished the last of the tasks and headed off to bed. The next morning, we would rise early to start laying out the products, making signs, and busying ourselves for the big day. Avatu Talu de Paev, Anne reported, is a good opportunity for her to sell her goods to a wider public because she has not yet obtained the national standard certification that allows her to sell to larger supermarkets and restaurants within the country. She cares deeply for the products that she produces, for they capture her ideology of what should be natural. This is one of the reasons why she left the capital of Estonia, Tallinn, to settle in the countryside in the pursuit of creating healthy foods that nourish not only the body, but also the mind and soul. She shared her desired outcomes of the event with me while pulling the fresh bread loaves from the oven. She hopes that it will be more than just selling out of everything being sold that day. She hopes to create new relationships with future clientele and that they will return to become loyal customers. For her, this was an opportunity for urbanites to come to the countryside and experience life at a slower pace, to taste what nature has to offer both tangible and intangible, and to taste true foods that were not manufactured by an industrial giant. As exemplified in Dmitri Sukras, Ethalia Dimara, and Anastasia Petro's article, Rural Tourism and Visitors' Expenditures for Local Food Products, Open Farm Day supports and showcases the regional products made by small-time farmers, and through this, enhance aspects of territorial identity and cultural distinctiveness, raising the overall attractiveness and appeal to the consumers. The actual day of the event had steady waves of families coming to the farm. Majority of those visiting Anne's farm were parents of young children. Very few came without children, and those that did were generally of an older age. As a participant observer, I theorize that these young families with children were seeking out natural foods made locally and were healthier food options. As for the older generation, it could be a form of nostalgia to taste foods that they had as young people and when things weren't as modern as they are today. 
and spent the entire day talking to people, showing them around, introducing some clientele to her favorite goats, and intermittently helping those that were selling the goat dairy products and selection of foods. Many people flocked to the part of the long dining table that held clear blue bowls filled with samples of tiny white cubes of goat cheeses. Customers nodded and smiled as these cheese enveloped their senses, enticing them for yet another taste. Many walked away with a small green bag filled with different types of cheese, and some even chose to buy goat's milk despite people's reservations about how goat's milk is thought to taste funkier due to being accustomed to industrially produced flavorless cow's milk. Anne elaborates on the health benefits of goat's milk and how it was a more suitable dairy beverage over cow's milk since the human body can easily digest it over the latter. There is also the notion held that those who are lactose intolerant are able to consume goat's milk without an issue. Anne and her team of helpers also made cherry cakes using the local orchard cherries and her chicken eggs. Harvested potatoes from her garden went into the potato salad paired with a lovely tangy vinaigrette, sausage rolls that were made with a pastry dough from the previous day, and a fruit smoothie made with goat's milk was offered to the hungry customers. While many came to see the animals, pet rabbits, and meat goats, more stayed for the actual food. This was an event where city folk could come to the countryside and taste food made naturally and locally. It was a journey and experience for rural cuisine. A handful of people shied away from the samples of goat cheese as well as goat's milk, claiming that goat's products have a musky goat flavor to it, or I don't really like it, but admitted that they've never really had goat's milk before. The food vendors, Anne's friends and two little girls, proclaimed that the notion was one to be tested and offered a small sample paired with a little speech of how delicious, healthy, and natural it is. These people were typically convinced and then reached for a second sample and eagerly dismissed their old beliefs about goat milk products. By the end of the day, all the fresh cheese cheeses were sold out, only a few bottles of half liters remained, and most of the platters that once held food stood empty, save for a few crumbs. Upon reflection, Anne shares that overall, she feels accomplished and hopeful that she made a good headway in establishing future clientele, both from those that tasted and bought products from her as well as those that she had extensive conversations with about how the farm is ran and the values that she holds true for herself and the products that she makes. Open Farm Day is a wonderful opportunity for small farmers to invite others to experience a rural culinary journey. In comparison to the mission of the Estonian ministries, Kodukon, and later, the goals reflect the success that Anne, a small goat farmer and producer, feels. The event facilitated the creation of new clientele, communication, and recognition with those outside of the local municipality that Anne lives and operates in. Not only do the food products, in its tangible form, feed and nourish the people that consume it, but it also nourishes the intangible notion of community, belonging, heritage, and cultural identity, particularly with those that choose to remain and reside in the countryside, all about the economic and physical hardships faced. The gastronomic aspect is essential to tourism as it is a way for the tourist to experience a deeper level of cultural understanding, as well as a way to contextualize the idiosyncratic characteristics of a place. This model, Avotu Talu De Bayev, created and implemented by multifarious organizations, proved to be successful for Anne. However, while Anne feels success from the day's event, there may be other small farms that do not feel the same way or did not reap as many benefits from it. What remains to be seen for Anne is if the success from that day proved to be long-term success with the return of new clientele as well as the old. And while this event does bring exposure and economic opportunities for these small farmers, it does not solve the larger issue that presses against the rural inhabitants. The fact that the countryside is still facing population decline to cities, either within the country or even abroad. Avatu Talu De Baev is simply one event organized by government organizations in hopes to reconnect and reinforce the relationship between the urban and rural. However, it will take more than one open farm day to revitalize the empty countryside. Time will tell whether the theories and implementation of rural cultural food tourism can help aid in restoring the significance and vitality of rural heritage, practices, and culture. For it is the farmers that not only provide biological sustenance to us, but these farmers also feed our heritage and identities. 
This concludes my discussion on rural cultural food tourism within Estonia. If there are any questions or comments, please leave it in the comment section below. And I thank you for your time and wish you a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.